Bible study. Our Bible study tonight uh, is continuing the series on seven churches of Revelation. Seven churches of Revelation. I'm grateful for those that are here in the family yeah. room tonight. And for those of you that are watching us virtually, uh, you've been so faithful in uh, this Bible study. And I get to see your comments and I get to see your questions. And I'm going to try to address some of the questions that I have seen over the last few weeks towards the end of this uh, session. All right. And so let's begin with a word of prayer. Eternal God, as we open up your word tonight. God, we pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. God, that you will lead us and guide us and direct us. To give us the proper interpretation. God, give us the right words in which to convey what you have done in this marvelous work we call Revelation. The Revelation to John that was authored by you, but penned by John, and now being read by us. We thank you because a long time ago you had uh, the desire to communicate with us even now in the 21st century and how this word still pertains to us. And so uh, we let ourselves take a back seat to your Holy Spirit. Give us that understanding. Give us that interpretation. God, give us uh, the ability to plant seeds into the hearts of your people so that they can take root and grow and they can be transformed by what your word is given to us. You said that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our eyes. No darkness can exist in the presence of light. And so God, give it to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so we've been talking about the seven churches of Revelation. Tonight we're talking about Sardis. Now, I only do Sardis because my uh, father in the ministry, Reverend Norwood, was born in Sardis, Mississippi. And that's all I knew about Sardis for a long time, was that you go down to Sardis, and then uh, you can get some of that good old catfish and what have you that they had done. But uh, I learned that they named their town after Sardis, the church. And so that was so fascinating to me, and that's when I began my love affair with the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation tells us some things, and like I said before, and I think we'll say it again tonight uh, as we go forward, that uh, we are blessed. Revelation is the only book in the Bible that starts out by saying, if you read this book and do what it says, uh, you will be blessed. Now, that's a promise I can hang on to, and I thank God for it. All right, so uh, last week we talked about a fire tire, right? And we know that these churches were real churches that existed in a real period of time, had real people with real issues going on, but they also mirror the history of the church. And so uh, Thyatira was connected in terms of this uh, particular theology with the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church is described in Thyatira. All right. And so, just like Thyatira was connected with the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the writing for Sardis is being written to the people of the Protestant Reformation. Now, let me explain what that is. You all have heard of Martin Luther King Jr., but he was named after the founder of the Reformation uh, a movement called Martin Luther. Right? This is Martin Luther, 1570, 17 AD. Now, that was the Protestant Reformation Church, meaning up to that point, the dominant church was the Roman Catholic Church. And I always tell people, now we're not bashing the Roman Catholic Church. People get to believe whatever they want to believe, right? And uh, their practices are their practices. We don't have any problems with that. But now, uh, the Roman Catholic Church had a certain ways about them. And now the Protestant Reformation Church also has various ways and specific ways about themselves. Now, that being said, now would you go get my iPad out of the office, please? I forgot to bring it up Thank you, sir. All right. So Sardis is compared to the Protestant Reformation. And I've asked Tiana to go get 
uh, my iPad. I have some notes on there that I want to share. But let's just, I just want to read this to you. I know those of you, uh, next, by next week, I'm hoping that we will have this all together. Um, but I need to read this to you because I don't think that you can actually make out what these words are uh, on the screen. So, as we affiliate with the Church of Tyre, here we go again, Thyatira, with the Roman Catholic Church, it is clear that as Jesus is writing to the church at Sardis, he is addressing his words to those who broke from the Roman Catholic Church and began, thank you, the Protestant Reformation Church, beginning in 1517 AD. The problem that Jesus had with the uh, Protestant Reformation Church or the movement called the Protestant Reformation is that they did not go far enough to distance themselves from the Roman Catholic Church. Let me tell you some of the things that came from the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the worship of people such as Mary, Joseph, and the saints, right? But the second commandment clearly tells us what? That we should only worship God and make no graven images. But yet today, and I need to say a little bit about this last week, the Roman Catholic Church has uh, uh, members in it that some of them no longer do this, some of them no longer worship people like Mary, Joseph, and the saints, but some of them do. The foundation of their church is that. And there are even some churches, and I'll give you this insight, there are some spiritual churches in our uh, understanding, in our reformation, as uh, Bishop Tim likes to call it. Uh, if you go to the Mother Church, you will see statues in the Mother Church. No, not all, no shade anywhere, because it's really what you do with the statues, right? Because there are many images that we do, uh, that we uh, take, but we don't necessarily worship them, right? So there's an image uh, in the back of our altar, and that is uh, with preacher, with God, with Jesus, all of that that was uh, drawn up there, and then also in the narthex by Fred Jones. Uh, those are images, but we don't worship those images. We use those images to remember Right? We use those images to reflect. And so I'm uh, not condemning the Roman Catholic Church for those that still have statues uh, in their uh, sanctuaries and how some of them may uh, reference to them, you know, when they do, you know, all hail Mary, mother full of grace, right? You know, the Lord is with you. Blessed are thou amongst women. I mean, they, they literally pray that prayer uh, as part of their liturgy. Second thing is uh, they need believe that baptism was salvation. In other words, it really didn't matter what was going on inside as long as you got baptized. Well, that's not the case, right? We are saved, as Romans tells us, that if you shall confess with thy mouth and believe in thy heart the Lord Jesus and that God had raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten his son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Baptism for us is an outward expression of an inward conviction, right? Different, right, from the Roman Catholic Church. Thirdly, uh, the Bible does not teach anything about celibacy, but yet, the Roman Catholic Church requires, and, and I'm going someplace with this, the, the Bible does not say anything about that, right? It doesn't say that a, a priest or a pastor or minister or whatever office you may have, doesn't say that you have to be silent, right? But forbidding priests to marry was one of the rules of the Roman Catholic Church. All right. And then uh, confessionalism. Now, people can call me up and say, Pastor, I need help with this. Would you pray with me? That type of thing, right? Uh, and I will do that. And many of our ministers also do the same thing, right? But they don't confess their sins to me, right? I don't want them to either. 
<laughs> but, uh, the priests, they have uh, uh, this uh, practice called confession, right? Where you go into two-sided closet, priests on one side, the parishioners on another. And again, I'm not condemning the Roman Catholic Church at all. Please understand that. I'm just expressing the differences between what we believe and what uh, they believe as well. Uh, all right, see, I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, but I will try to make an adjustment here put it in one of these other texts. Okay. All right. All right. The other thing that they believe is in a thing called purgatory. Purgatory. Purgatory is what I describe as a holding place. Uh, you're not ready to go to heaven. You're not ready to go to hell. You're in there, in between. They believe that the process of sanctification uh, is uh, completed in what is called purgatory. Then they go to heaven. We believe to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Right? And so in our faith belief, our reformation, we believe that the moment we pass away, the spirit goes immediately to God. Right? There's no holding place. There's no waiting room. Right? That's what purgatory is. The other thing they believe is a theory of what's called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. That has to deal with the Holy Communion. Now, Protestant Reformation said there is, we don't believe in transubstantiation, meaning that when they take communion, the wafer that we take or the bread that we eat or the wine or the grape juice that we drink, Roman Catholics believe that that actually becomes the actual body of Jesus Christ. The actual blood. Protestant Reformation said, no, we believe that it is symbolic. Uh, we know that uh, when he said in John 6 and 53, he said uh, that we must eat his body and must drink his blood. But then he clarified it by saying, but these things I'm speaking to you, these are spiritual matters, not physical matters, right? Uh, the other thing is um, indulgences. Now, this was something that was created uh, as an effort to raise money for the Roman Catholic Church back in its early days before the Reformation. Indulgences was the doctrine of where you would give money on behalf of your relatives who are in purgatory, and you could actually pay their way into heaven. All right, All right. so now the Protestant Reformation Martin Luther said, No, we don't believe that. Now, the other one is uh, penance. Penance meaning, and, and you may have seen this, I forget the name of the movie, where this uh, guy, he, was, he wasn't a monk. Uh, I forget the terminology that it was, but he would cut himself. He was doing penance by causing himself harm so that when he died, he would spend less time in purgatory. In other words, they related suffering to the time you spend in purgatory. There was some redemptive value in suffering, right? Self-inflicted suffering, right? Um, um, okay, uh, now that's, that's enough on that. What the Roman Catholic Church did, Martin Luther said, these things we do not believe in. And there are others. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So the Protestant Reformation Church began to move away. This is what's the other problem with the Protestant Reformation Church. They didn't go far enough from Roman Catholicism. They didn't remove all the things. See, Roman Catholicism, and if we're not careful, we will do the same thing. We will be making up rules as we go along and tied to salvation. Right? I give unto the Lord 
my tithes and my offerings, not because it purchases salvation. It's because I love the Lord. And I want to do what the Lord asks me to do. But it is in no way tied to my salvation. My salvation is secure. Right? Reverend Grace sang the song, sealed until the day of redemption. That is biblical. Once you become saved and you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart uh, that God raised Jesus from the dead, that God died, sent Jesus, that God allowed Jesus to die, that Jesus rose again from the dead, that's your salvation. And it's hard to keep churches going because a lot of times churches will guilt you into coming to church. But you come to church because you worship the God that has been so good to you. It's not a requirement, right? And I hope I don't lose anybody out there in virtual, man. I know the ones here, they're not going to go But when I tell you the truth, I'm telling you that it's not by works that we gain salvation. But the works we do are because of the faith we have. Maybe I can put it that way. All right. So then, a little later on, I'm going to show you where Sardis, which is representing the Protestant Reformation, also began to move away from teaching the Bible to teaching them church traditions and other doctrines that are nowhere in the Bible. Right? The Bible is our ultimate authority. And we have, as we will do, as any organization will do, or organism, however you want to refer to it, we begin to tack on extra little requirements, right? But they're based on our traditions. And do you know why some of our traditions do not stand the test of time? Because they were not meant for this time. We push it because that's what our families did, that's what uh, everybody did um, uh, when, when, when they were coming up. They used to do it this way. Uh, but, you know, time changes practices and procedures, but it never changes the word of God. This is what was going on in Sars. Now, I'm going to ask this question, and I'm going to need y'all to speak up loud. What similarities do you see? Not with your own individual church, but let's talk about the church universal, right? We're not putting anybody on trial here. We're going to be very generic. But what things do you see in the universal church that can fit what Sardis is going to be condemned for doing and what I've explained to you tonight? Can you see any similarities in that? I'll take a sip of water while you think about it. But don't be shy. Nobody? Not ready to talk? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Let's move on. All right. So we have these seven churches. And we are now on the fifth church. We've talked about Ephesus. We've talked about Smyrna. Uh, Reverend Gore talked the week that I was out of town on Pergamos. Uh, I last week talked about Thyatira. Today we're talking about Sardis. And in the next two weeks, we'll be talking about Philadelphia and Laodicea. All very unique expressions of God. Now, why do we study these churches? I know you can answer that. Reverend Gore, why do we study? <laughs> why do we study Revelation? What is the point? To give us some direction on where we should be headed toward to be more like Christ. And to give us some direction. Church. Say it again. To, so we can be more more of an example of what Christ wants in the church. Yes. Because remember, these letters are these letters that were authored by Jesus, not the Jesus the lowly Jesus. But these were written after he had already ascended and had all the powers. This is the powerful Jesus. 
he wrote back, and Reverend Gore, excellent answer. So that we would know what it is that Jesus wants from us, right? And the ones that are interested in that uh, would be the ones that would dare to venture into a study of the book of Revelation, right? The book of Revelation is more corporate than it is individual, but it is also individual, right? Because a corporate body can be no more than the individual ones that make up the corporate body, right? All right, and that's why we're studying here. Now, let's go directly to the Word, and I hope you can see this at home. If not, uh, go to Revelation 3, 1 through 6. I've chosen a new international version, right? To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. I want you to keep that open as we go piece by piece. To whom this letter was written, Revelation 3, 1a, to the angel of the church in Psalms. Right? The person responsible for the church in Sardis. The person responsible for the spiritual development of the church members of Sardis. Remember, Sardis was a real church with real people, with real issues, with real problems. With, and, and in the context of this, they were persecuted just like every other church that was written in Revelation. So if that church was persecuted, that means the individuals had to endure persecution. So we know who it's written to. Jesus describes himself. He says, these things I say, he who has the seven spirits of God, the seven spirits of God, uh, the seven spirits of God, I want uh, to go with this. Isaiah predicted the fullness of the Holy Spirit working through Jesus, in and through Jesus. The seven spirits of God is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. I'll give that to you uh, again. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him that's what Isaiah said about Jesus. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, the respect of the Lord. That is the spirit that gives us that. The Holy Spirit gives us a healthy respect for the Lord, right? Now, I am going to move, all right, I know your works, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. What does that really mean? And how can we reflect that to today's society? I'm not going to pick on any individual church, but you have a lot of churches. Yet, it seems like we have very minimal impact on folks that don't go to church, right? Yesterday, 
we had shootings on the west side. We had down in Louisiana, I think it was, somewhere else, but just all over. The influence, this is why God gave us that theme for this year, enlarge my territory. Territory is not physical. It's influential. We want to be able to change. We want to be able to lead people to change. Because we can't change it. We can only lead them to the one that can change. So, we got a name. Everybody knows about some church. But the impact of that church is it fruitful or could it be classified as dead? Dead meaning not having any impact. We were called to make an impact, right? Matthew 28 tells us that was Jesus' last will and testament. Somebody pull up Matthew 28, around 28, I think it's 28. Somebody pull it up. Start where it says go. And I know people come to church, they want to be uplifted, and I try to mix my messages so that I can uplift them on Sunday. But then I also want to make sure that I encourage, but then I also want to make sure that I instruct. And sometimes the hardest thing is for people to receive correction, but we want to do that. Say that real loud, Matthew 28. 16. 16. Mm -hmm. I want to read it. Okay. <laughs> then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain of where Jesus had been uh, told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Starts with, I've got all power and authority. And the inference is, when it says, therefore, the inference is, I'm giving it to you. And here's what I want you to do with it. Right? Now, I know a lot of us, we're still trying to get our own selves together. I get that. But there comes a time where we have to be able to be together enough to where we can follow what Jesus asked us to do. Right? And therefore, our name will be alive, but our works will also be alive. We will make an impact, right? That's what we're looking at. All right, so as we have done in every session here, we have talked about, uh, you know, what uh, who Jesus was talking about, talking to. Uh, we were talking about uh, Jesus' description of himself. Then we talk about what they are doing well. Now, most scholars do not believe that Jesus said one complimentary thing to the church in Sardis. Remember the uh, other church that we were talking about? Um, not Pergamum, um, Ephesus. They were going under, they had, I believe that was the one that we, we, we dealt with. They were going through such tribulation, Jesus did not offer a word of correction. So he didn't follow this pattern for each one of these churches. He did what he felt is best. But most theologians, including the one that we're using in our study and our in reference today, um, he did not believe that Jesus said anything complimentary. I differ. Because I jump down to verse 4, where it says, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their cloth, who have not given over to the devil, who have not given over to the old traditions, who are willing to 
do what Jesus said, period. That's complimentary to me. But technically, that comes later on when he's giving them uh, uh, words of uh, correction. But I wanted to say uh, that that's a good thing. Wherever we are, whatever church you're part of, don't get caught up with the ones that are not doing it. Right? Earlier in the scripture, it says, strengthen, as a matter of fact, uh, in verse 2, and I'm going to go there in just a minute. Uh, strengthen what remains. A few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, I preached a sermon on uh, strengthen what you got left. Right? And here's the thing we cannot focus our attention on those that are not. Because if you watch them, you'll get distracted. Right? Because you'll say, oh my goodness, nobody came, uh, not enough people came to the Bible study. No, I'm focusing on the ones that are in the amount. Strengthen what remains because each one of you all can go out and strengthen another 20, 25 folks. Right? You can get busy. We don't worry about who's not doing it. We make sure that we worry about what we're doing. And then we trust the Lord for the rest of it. So the good news here to me is that there are still a few people who have not compromised in your churches, wherever you are, whatever church you're at, you're going to have those that are the onlookers. They come for the entertainment value. They come to be entertained. Uh, they don't want to do any work. They want to come and they want to hear a good sermon. They want to hear good singing. But they don't want to do anything beyond that. And if you press them to do beyond what they're comfortable doing, what will they do? They'll find another church where they can do whatever they want to do. Now, that's not all people, but that's been my experience, right? Uh, and that's why I have to balance my messages. Because I don't want to come with a word of correction every Sunday, right? I don't even want to hear it every Sunday. But there are times where the Spirit speaks and says, you need to know this. In other words, my mother used to tell me, and I never understood it, still don't understand it to this day. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask her about it. But when she used to whoop my mind, she would say, it hurts me more than it hurts you. And I'm like, ain't no way in the world it hurts you more than what you're doing right now. No. But it helped me to grow. It helped me to become disciplined. So sometimes the word of correction works in conjunction with the word of encouragement, right? And this is what Jesus was saying to the people of Zion. He was saying, friends, you may have some folks that are not doing what they're supposed to do, but there's still a few of you all that are doing what's supposed to be done, right? You take your time, you make your sacrifice, and then you offer the sacrifice of praise. Who who could not be doing something else on Sunday mornings? All of us could. All of us could do something else on Sunday. I mean, Sunday has just turned into another day of the weekend for some people. But some of us, we remember that we're supposed to uh, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, I got seven days. I can give one of them and dedicate it to keeping the Sabbath holy. That means practicing holy things. That means learning about how to become holy. That means learning how to serve the Lord. That means giving of your time, your talent, and your resources. Why? Because I have to. I don't have to. Remember, I told you earlier, your salvation is secure. So coming to church on Sunday morning does not make you get into heaven. But when you really love the Lord, just like any other relationship in your life, you can't say that you love somebody and don't spend no time. Hmm? It comes with it. All right. Then he moves on to the words of correction. He says, be, but listen, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. The inference is there are some good things that you're doing. 
It's not all of what I want you to do. But what I do want you to do in this very specific year, strengthen what's left. Strengthen what you got left. And all I know is that the God I serve is so well known for taking little yeah. and doing a lot. Strengthen what remains, that's not the end of the story. Because if you strengthen what remains, then what remains grows and it increases. And truly their influence in the territory, right? Enlarge my territory. You take that little bit. You take those two fish and five loaves of bread. That's what Jesus did all throughout his ministry. He took the little things that nobody was really paying attention to. And he was able to do some great things. That's why he's a great God. That's why he's a great God. So strengthen the things that remain. And then it goes on in verse 3 to say, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. In other words, those of you that take time to study the word of God, you earnestly listen either at your church or virtually, or you get online and you, you find sermons that can bless you, and you know you have your preferred messengers that get all of that, that's fine. As long as the word is getting in here and in here, I don't care where you get it from, but just bring the fruits back right. to your church so that you can help us to move in the way God wants us to move, right? He gives us a warning. He wants us to hold, to remember how you ever see and heard, hold fast and repent. What does repent mean? Repent means to turn around. If you're going in one direction, and as you study the word of God and you discover that you're not going in quite the direction that God would have you to go into, you should, the first thing you should want to do is turn away from it. Find the right direction for your life. I'm here to tell you, I'll be 63 years old in August. It seems like I was 20 years old yesterday, right? We don't have a lot of time in this earth. And the time that we have, the song says, time is filled with swift transition. I thought I had a whole, I mean, I never thought about it. I never thought about getting older. But I realize now that my time is precious now. More precious than I gave it credit for in the past. And I want to do everything that I can to complete my assignment. But I know my assignment. I'm trying to talk with people that don't know their assignment yet. Because how can you get on, how can you get on a road and you don't know where you're going? You've got to know what God has called you to do. And then prepare yourself to do it. Life is filled with discovery, preparation, and then execution. That's what it is. Discover in your youth. Prepare as you get a little older. Execute. Right? Discover, prepare, execute. I can sit down on, on, for the rest of the night on just that. If you just get that, right? All right. So, there were no technical words of encouragement here. I do not know why uh, there were no words of encouragement other than what I brought to you before. Um, but there is a promise. And to me, this promise is a form of encouragement. He says in Revelation 3 and 5, he says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Let me drop this on you, and then we'll be done for the night. Look at where uh, it says, I will not blot out his name. I will not blot out his name from the book of life. The book of life is a comp compilation of all the names for every person who has ever lived on this earth. When they're born, 
their name is written in the book of life. Right? Because God foreknew. See, this is where you got to really, you, you, you may not be able to fathom this kind of depth of how deep God is. But God knew. What did he tell Jeremiah? Before you were born, in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I know what I called you to do. God sees this way. We see from present to future. If one thing you need to understand, God sees from future to present. In other words, what he is inspiring you to do now is because he already knows what the end is. Yes, yes. And guess who else might have a clue as to what the end is? The one that is standing in your way to get to that destiny. Hmm. Hmm? If you can get stopped before you reach your destiny, then the devil is one. That's what the devil does, right? But he says here, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. In other words, your name is already in the book of life. The only way your name gets blotted out is if you renounce your belief in Jesus Christ, right? God gives all of us the opportunity. He starts us out successful. Going to heaven. But here, if you renounce Jesus, then your name gets blotted out. My friends, there is a heaven. And there is a hell. Your name, when it gets blotted out, you're going down. <laughs> if your name is in there, you're going up. Let me just put it that way. And I have no clue what direction heaven is right now. I, I, we, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. But uh, let, it, let me uh, just ask if there are any questions. Now would be a good time uh, to, to, to ask them or if there's any commentary or any thoughts. We're getting close to our time. Uh, but I want you to, as you ponder that, Matthew 7, 22 through 23. The question of salvation is not necessarily whether we know Jesus, but whether he knows us. My God. Hmm? My God. If we have no personal relationship with Jesus, what does he, what would he say? Matthew 7, 22 through 23. On judgment day, first let me straighten it out. Some folks are so consumed with living this life, this form of life, that we don't even want to accept the fact that there is going to be a day of judgment. We will give an account for everything that we do and everything we don't do. He says, on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesy in your name. Surely if you prophesy in Jesus' name, you going to heaven? Wait a minute. We cast out demons in your name. <laughs> if you can cast out demons, if somebody came into our church on Sunday morning and prophesied, cast out demons, and then it says perform many miracles in your name, I think the whole church would accept it. Oh, they perform these great miracles. They prophesied. They did all of this. But he says, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, and perform many miracles in your name, but I will reply, this is Jesus, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. Right? All I'm saying is, if this Bible study means anything to you, take away these thoughts, the, the word of God that we've been giving you uh, over these past weeks. Continue to tune in for the next couple of weeks uh, as we continue to go further into the book of Revelation. We're just going to deal with the first three chapters. 
because that's where the letters to the seven churches were written. Uh, but I'm telling you, this has transformed my thinking. This has transformed the way that I think about things. And it has given me clearer instructions. I've got clarity. Somebody say clarity. clarity. I'm getting clarity on what God wants us to do by seeing what he told them not to do. And by seeing what he told them to do. Thousands of years later, here we are. It's our turn now. God has called us for just this generation now to serve this present age. Yes. Everybody that came before us, they did a great job. From preacher all the way up. But now's our time. Amen. This is the time for us. And so I'm praying that God will go before you to make your way safe, easy, and successful. Peaceful. Prosperous, abundant, and productive. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make the Lord's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of the Lord's countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Bible study said, Amen. Amen. And Amen. Now, for those of you that are watching, I want to worship on. I want to, to just pray for the sick and shut in. We have many on our sick and shut-in list, and this is the only way that they can come to church or to be a part of this fellowship is virtually. And so I want to be able to pray uh, tonight. Uh, Reverend Chanel, why don't you come up and pray for our sick and shut-in? There's one in particular that I want to pray for, and that is uh, uh, Mikey Sammy. Mikey had surgery today. And then we have other members that are going up for surgery very soon. Uh, I'm calling Mikey's name because I know that Malik and Mikey are probably watching. If they're not watching, they will be watching. But there's many others. And I don't have to listen to them, but you know who they are. Reverend, would you just come and close us out in prayer for them? And thank you so very much. Father, in the natural name of Jesus Christ, we come before you this evening, O God, just to tell you thank you. Thank you. We thank you for being a God that sits high and looks low. We thank you, O God, for your grace, your goodness, your mercy, your love, your kindness. We thank you for being better to us on any given day than we could ever be to ourselves, O God. Now, Lord God, we thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for our pastor teaching this Bible study, Father God, helping us to remember what we need to know about your word, Father God, so that we can live a life that is pleasing in your sight and do your will for the greater good of your people. Lord God, we lift up the sick and the shedding. We lift up the homebound, Father God. We ask that you would go into their homes, their, their places where they reside, Father God, in the hospitals and the convalescent homes, wherever they are, Father God. And we ask that you have your way. We know that you are the great physician, Father God, and healing is a part of who you are, Father God. So we ask that you heal right now in the name of Jesus. Yes. We know that all power is in your hand, Father God. So all we have to do is ask. Your word says ask and it shall be given. So we ask right now that you will heal the minds of your people, the, the bodies of your people, the spirits of your people, Father God. Somebody is going through a transition. Lord God, they don't know how they got there. They don't know why, Father God. But we ask that you give them clarity and understanding. Give them hope. Give them faith. Give them peace, Father God, in this situation, Lord Jesus. And those that are taking care of people that are yes. sick, Father God. Yes. We ask that you lift them up and strengthen them right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we plead your blood on every sickness, every malady, Father God, in the name of Jesus, because we know that you are able. Your word declares that you are able to do exceeding abundantly of all that we can ask for thinking that all power is in your hand. And oh God, we believe in your power. We believe that you are healing if the world don't believe it, Father God. We believe and we know that you are capable of doing what no other power can do, that you can raise the dead, that you can heal the sick, that you can cause cancer to be eradicated in the name of Jesus. So God, we ask that you look on 
heart conditions, on respiratory issues, Father God, on, on um, circulatory situations, Father God. We ask that you just have your way. Peripheral vascular disease, those who are, have end-stage renal disease, those who have to go up and see the doctor for a stress test, Father God. We ask that everything will be all right in the name of yes. Jesus. Lord God, you know where your people are and you know what we stand in the need of. And Lord God, we trust you. We trust you because we know that you are able. Yes. And we thank you for being an able God. Yes. We thank you because we can remember how you have brought us out and how you've helped us before and how you healed yes. somebody else, Father God. You yes. know that what yes. you've done for others, you can do the very same yes. thing for us. So we remember your goodness, oh God. Yes. And we are going to move forward in your goodness, in your greatness, Father God, knowing that all things work together. And we know yeah. that all things work together for your good, for the good of them that love your God, to them who are called according to your purpose. So God, as we leave this place, but never your presence, go before us, Father God. Make it easy, safe, and successful our way until we meet again, is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, thank you. All right, good night.